Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what relationship it has with UK visas and immigration. Minister Humphrey Yusuf. The Scottish Government has regular contact with UK visas and immigration. Uh, in matters relating to Scotland's interests and priorities, we will continue to press the UK Government to provide an immigration system that meets Scotland's needs. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. I was contacted by two constituents who required assistance on an immigration issue. And as there are no MPs at present, I was approached as their local MSP. On contacting the UK Visas and Immigration Department, I was told the following. If they have not already done so, they can contact a Westminster parliamentary candidate during the current pre-election period. Does the Minister agree with me that this decision undermines our democracy and that UK Visas and Immigration is suggesting that constituents contact a member of the public for assistance rather than an elected representative? Minister. Yes, I agree entirely uh, with the member. It is completely unacceptable that any part, any department of the UK government could demonstrate such a, a lack of respect for our hardworking members of the Scottish Parliament across this entire chamber. It's essential that our MSPs are able to represent their constituents appropriately. I call on whatever, whoever there's the incoming UK government uh, to take a respectful approach to Scotland's MSPs and work with us to best serve the people of Scotland. It's a practical issue and pragmatic issue, as Gordon MacDonald rightly demonstrates, but also this is people's lives. Uh, people are getting ripped apart, their families are getting ripped apart because of uh, UK immigration rules and uh, hard-working MSPs uh, are, are being completely dismissed by this UK government department. So I agree with them entirely. It's an affront to our democratic mechanisms and completely unacceptable. A point of order, Christine Graham. A presiding officer, on the point of respect, just share my concern. Ah, it's now a change that there was nobody in here on the front benches of the opposition for general questions, which I think is disrespectful to yourself and to the chamber. There is no such rule, and I do know that all of the members who wish to ask a question are here in the chamber, and that is the priority. Question two, Nanette Mill. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will use consequential funding to help provide defibrillators in public places. Minister Maureen Mott. Out of Hospital Cardiac Arrest, a strategy for Scotland was published on the 27th of March 2015. This is a five-year plan to improve Scotland's response to the out of hospital cardiac arrest with the aim of saving an additional 1,000 lives by 2020. <clears throat> At the Scottish Cardiac Arrest Symposium on the 27th of March, as well as launching the strategy, I announced that 100,000 of health consequential spending will be used to support the delivery of OHCA strategy. Work with stakeholders is now in hand to ensure that this funding is used to best effect to strengthen the chain of survival to deliver improved cardiac arrest outcomes. Milne. Uh, thank the Minister for her response. Um, following the, the budget, George Osborne announced £1 million for defibrillators south of the border, which will result in an extra 100000 for the Scottish Government to spend. Um, will the Minister commit to this, this money being used to help fund defibrillators in public places across Scotland? And will she agree to undertake a review into the sighting of defibrillators in public places in Scotland to provide an accurate picture of their availability? Minister. Um, <clears throat> yes, I agree uh, with Nanette Milne. I mentioned the chain of survival, and that's absolutely crucial. It's not just about the provision of defibrillators. It's about rapid recognition of cardiac arrest, early bystander cardio CPR uh, uh, response. It's about early defibrillation, effective pre-hospital resuscitation and advanced post-resuscitation care. And I absolutely agree with her that you know, lots of organisations are fundraising themselves and have provided uh, defibrillators. And it's very important that we map where these all are and the ambulance uh, service knows where they are so that they can inform bystander CPR uh, resuscitators. Question number three, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support it will provide to the kind of nurse-led initiatives highlighted in the RCN Scotland campaign, Nursing at the Edge. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government welcomes the RCN's Nursing at the Edge campaign and the excellent work highlighted in its report 
Nurses, of course, have a critical role to play in tackling inequalities by empowering communities and individuals to be involved in decisions that affect their own care, helping to assess and address local population health needs, and providing specialist support and intervention with particularly vulnerable individuals, families or groups. Wide-ranging work is underway to strengthen this contribution further. We will also continue to ensure that we have the right numbers of nurses in place with the right skills to deliver high quality of care to the people of Scotland, whatever their needs. Malcolm Chisholm. I agree that as well as general action to uh, deal with inequalities in society, it is very important that the health service should have specific initiatives uh, addressing uh, those who are most disadvantaged and vulnerable in society, and that the nurse-led initiatives highlighted by the RCN are a very important part uh, of that. Will she meet with the Royal College of Nursing to discuss how these kind of nurse-led initiatives uh, can, be, uh, can be promoted, uh, including discussion of training uh, and research issues so that the new integration authorities can provide the best uh, kind of uh, services possible to address the health inequalities outcome. Minister. I say to Malcolm Chisholm, obviously I meet regularly with the RCN, very happy to meet with them on the specifics of the, uh, the, the campaign and to look at the issues that Malcolm Chisholm has raised. I mean, the integration, the new integrated joint boards, of course, have a um, responsibility to look at how they invest to uh, tackle health inequalities uh, within the communities that they are serving. And I think there is an important opportunity through integration uh, to do that more effectively. Uh, but happy to meet with the RCN and, and take forward the issues relating to this campaign. Question number four, in the name of Graham Pearson, has been withdrawn uh, for understandable reasons. Question five, Margaret McCurdle. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Rolls-Royce regarding its presence in East Kilbride. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government's Economic Development Agency, Scottish Enterprise, is in regular contact with Rolls-Royce. Scottish Enterprise officials most recently met with Rolls-Royce at its East Kilbride and Inchinnan sites on the 31st of March, following the company's announcement of potential job losses at its UK facilities. The purpose of that meeting was to discuss the implications of this announcement and what support could be provided to reduce any impact on its sites in Scotland. Margaret McCullough. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The decision of Rolls-Royce to withdraw from East Kilbride, as you know, and move to Renfrewshire was meant to secure jobs. Now we know there's going to be a wave of redundancies. Will the Scottish Government urge Rolls-Royce to seek an alternative to job losses and will they also urge them to cooperate with the local council in finding a new use for their soon-to-be vacant site in East Kilbride? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I, I think it's important to recall that the uh, announcement that was made on the 26th of March uh, by Rolls-Royce was part of a group restructuring exercise that was previously announced in November 2014 which affects 2,600 of the Rolls-Royce staff worldwide. So this is not just a specifically a Scottish issue in relation to the short-term point that Margaret McCulloch has raised. Um, the, on the question of maintaining employment, that will be at the heart of the representations that the government, through Scottish Enterprise, makes to Rolls-Royce and part of the approach that we take to finding the mechanisms and the interventions that we can take forward that will support employment um, within Scotland uh, on behalf of Rolls-Royce. The, the move to Inshinnan um, is taking place um, as it was previously announced. Uh, the government will continue to discuss with uh, Rolls-Royce the importance of employment within Scotland and do whatever we can in the support available to us to assist the company in uh, and undertaking that dialogue. And finally, Margaret McCulloch raised the issue about the future of the site in East Kilbride. Uh, I appreciate the significance of that manufacturing site, and it is important that the company works constructively and actively with South Lancashire Council and with Scottish Enterprise in finding ways of ensuring that such an important and prestigious manufacturing site is used for further manufacturing activity in the future. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I say to um, the Cabinet Secretary that cooperation is indeed crucial in things like this, and could I ask him, sadly, yet again to impress upon South Lanarkshire Council that cooperation works both ways, and it would be very useful if they would include all political representatives and parties in their area 
in the struggle to bring work to East Kilbride through the East Kilbride Task Force. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I, I, I think it is important that there is cooperation on these, these points. If I think uh, to the experience that we had, uh, that we've had in different circumstances where we've had to deal with employment loss, uh, the government has uh, one example springs to mind of where we convened the task force in West Lothian to deal with the halls of Broxburn um, issue. We um, invited and welcomed participation from uh, constituency members elected to this parliament as uh, party colleagues of mine, but we also included um, representatives of the Labour Party who were constituency members for uh, the area in Broxburn. Uh, so I do think it is important that we try, wherever possible, to work collectively and collaboratively to try to address what are difficult circumstances affecting members of the public uh, and the uncertainties that come with the, the loss of employment. Question six, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS 5 and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of NHS 5 to discuss matters of importance to local people. Claire Baker. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the First Minister, in her previous role as Health Secretary, stated her desire to get bonuses in the health service under control. Earlier this month, following an FOI by the Scotsman, it was found that this had not been achieved with the continuing use of discretionary awards and discretionary payments, the latter of which has risen by £3.5 million. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if she has discussed bonuses with NHS Fife and if she is aware of any plans by the Board to award such payments? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of course, um, Claire Baker will be aware that uh, distinction awards, which were of course paid under the previous administration, were uh, stopped uh, under this administration, uh, led by uh, the First Minister when she was Cabinet Secretary for Health. Uh, the issue of discretionary payments is, is a different matter to distinction awards, which I'm sure the member will be aware of. Uh, and uh, that is something, of course, which is part of the uh, system, has always been part of the system uh, and continues to be so. But I think it's very important that the, the member understands the difference between distinction awards and discretionary payments. But I'm certainly happy to write to her to explain that in more detail so she fully understands the difference. Question seven, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met South Lanarkshire Council. Minister Marco Biaggi. Ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including South Lanarkshire Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people in Scotland. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. Could I ask the Minister that next time you visit South Lanarkshire Council, um, he tells them about the very successful application by EK East Kilbride Shop Mobility on the People and Communities Fund grant that was recently given. And could he impress upon South Lanarkshire Council the very particular needs of town centres in new towns uh, when it comes to town centre regeneration? Minister. The Scottish Government has already been very pleased to highlight uh, shop mobility when we launched the online town centre uh, toolkit just uh, a few weeks ago. And I know that uh, the member has been uh, extensively involved with uh, East Cabride shop mobility, including helping them at the start uh, of the process to getting this PCF grant, which uh, shows that uh, the, the contribution that members can make. And I would also pay tribute to her constant uh, repeated personal representations to me uh, in the run-up to the announcement. Uh, I was very pleased to see that Shop Mobility received support from People and Communities Fund, now part of the Community Empowerment Fund, helping groups across the country. Margaret Mitchell. With interchange construction work, Bodmore residents have been subjected to constructions, lorries, parking illegally on the road in front of driveways, and have had to put up with excessive dust, dirt and noise. Can the, the Minister confirm that South Lanarkshire Council has oversight of this part of the construction work? And if so, will he urge it to look into these issues? Minister. I would urge uh, all councils to respond to issues raised by uh, people uh, living within their areas. And I can undertake to write to the member with uh, further information once I have had a chance to investigate and to discuss with the council in question. Question eight, Margaret McDougall. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that Ayrshire College is facing a shortfall in student support funding. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. 
Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that students at all colleges across Scotland are supported throughout their studies. Uh, Ms McDougall will be aware that earlier this year I announced that the estimated £7 million shortfall uh, in student support funding for 2014-15 would be met. Uh, since then, the Scottish Funding Council has been working closely with colleges, uh, including Ayrshire College, to ensure that all students uh, remain financially supported. Going forward, the Funding Council will ensure that funding for student support is matched more closely to colleges' estimates of need, and I understand that this will result in an additional 10% £900,000 in student support funds uh, for Ayrshire College in 2015-16. Margaret McDougall. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. This year, Ayrshire College and other colleges had to cover a shortfall in student support funding by using depreciation funds, money which is not meant to be used for this purpose, and some colleges don't even have this money to spend. This situation simply isn't good enough and students are suffering due to a lack of funding. What assurance can the Scottish Government give the student support funding will be fully funded next year so that colleges don't have to use depreciation funds to via funds from discretionary funds into bursaries, meaning that colleges are then unable to meet requests from students, particularly mature students with hardship challenges like housing costs. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would have hoped uh, Ms McDougall would have uh, welcomed the additional funds uh, made available to uh, Ayrshire College. Um, in addition to the £900,000 in core student support available, there is also £320,000 in student support available for uh, European social funded students. And this is an additional £1.2 million additional funding uh, for student support uh, in Ayrshire College, um, who are now receiving a total of £10.5 million uh, for student support and this is a 47% increase uh, in real terms in student support since 2006 and 7. and the Scottish Funding Council uh, has made additional funds available as part of the in-year redistribution process uh, and we will carry out the same exercise uh, moving forward in 2015-16 uh, and of course we will look to a, a longer term um, solution there is a, a very valid debate going on um, with, uh, in further education in terms of an, an entitlement based system uh, versus uh, a discretionary based system and we are alert to that debate and uh, engaging uh, with uh, relevant stakeholders on that matter. Jake Brody. Thank you. Uh, it is understood that the reclassification of the college sector by the Office of National Statistics changed the financial reporting rules resulting in confusion and the freezing of some £17 million of Scottish college cash budgets. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise if the Scottish Government was consulted on this change and what has been done to ensure this money is not lost to the sector? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mr Brody touches on an important point. I mean, as a result of the unwelcome ONS reclassification, uh, colleges became subject to two sets of financial reporting rules and a conflict arose between these two sets uh, of reporting rules, effectively freezing uh, £17 million pounds, uh, of cash uh, from budgets. And it isn't, of course, helpful when UK bodies make changes which have uh, a far-reaching impact uh, on Scottish uh, institutions. Uh, notwithstanding this change uh, and the challenges caused by this change, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Funding Council did indeed uh, work together with the college sector to allow colleges to release those funds uh, to spend on shared priorities, including uh, putting more money into financially supporting students, which I'm sure we can all agree uh, is an imperative uh, priority to enable students to complete their studies. Question nine, Mark McDonald. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact on the lowest income households in Scotland of the spending reductions required to achieve the targets laid out in the Charter for Budget Responsibility. Minister Mark Biaggi. The three largest parties in the last UK Parliament signed up to the Charter for Budget Responsibility, which commits them to billions more cuts to public services and the benefit system in the first years of the next Parliament. We already know that the most deprived parts of the UK have borne the brunt of the UK Government's austerity programme, with child poverty organisations warning that an additional 100,000 children in Scotland could be living in relative poverty after housing costs by 2020 because of UK Government welfare reforms, it is essential that we adopt an alternative approach to cutting the deficit as advocated by the Scottish Government. 
Briefly, Mr Macdonald. Thank you. Does the Minister agree we cannot sustain further austerity which results in those with the least being hurt the most? And does he share my belief that what we need to see is a commitment for public spending increases which would ensure that we can help those who need it most and get our economy working to its full potential? Briefly, Minister. I would agree that modest increases in public spending can still see the deficit come down year on year and ensure that ideological cuts that prolong the recession can be replaced by an investment in recovery. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one.